All right. Let's go ahead and cease our discussion of the criminal justice system and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and continue on to stress analysis. Um, so welcome back to Mechanics of Deformable Bodies. Um, you all have a homework assignment due on Tuesday, which means today is the last class before it's due. So I didn't know if anybody has looked at it, if anybody has any questions, anything uh, at all that I can do to help address it. Um, and I've seen some looks going, uh, I just walked in and realized, oh yeah, we do have a homework assignment. <laughs> I know things. Um, so, uh, any questions at all? And keep in mind we're not going to be here next Monday. Um, cause of, well, I mean, I might be around, but I don't, I'm not sure. Long and short of it is, nobody's here on Monday because it's Labor Day. Um, no questions? Okay, all right. Keep in mind it's due uh, 8 a.m. when you come in class and all that. It uh, should be a pretty straightforward assignment. I don't think there's anything terribly complicated about it. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get the sign-in sheet uh, started. Um, so let's sort of recap uh, where we are and where we're headed. I like to do that at the beginning of every lecture. That way we know what's going on. So we have spent this, you know, these past few lectures trying to define two of the most fundamental concepts that we're going to use throughout the semester, the concept of stress and strain. And last time what we did is we explored, well, how are stress and strain related in terms of uh, uh, does that relationship change when you're looking at um, different materials? You know, do you have different stress-strain relationships for brass than you do for concrete, than you do for polymers, than you do for ceramics, or, or, or what have you? And so that's what we did last time is tried to explore stress-strain relationships because they're one of the most fundamental um, uh, pieces of information that we as engineers like to use when we're in the concept of design. And, and, and I'd argue that uh, the last lecture really completed what I would call the first big module or first big chunk of this course um, because it was all about uh, defining our fundamental topics, stress, strain, and their relationship. All right, does, does anybody have any questions about any of the stuff we've talked about up until now, just in general? Okay. So what I want to do now is I want to start getting into some of the applications uh, of these topics. So we've defined stress, we've defined strain. I want to start applying those towards some of the problems that we as uh, engineers face. And I'm going to start with what really is the most direct application with, uh, uh, of what we've been talking about which is the idea of an axially loaded member. And that's any member where I'm, I'm taking it and I'm either stretching it or pushing on it, just either tension or compression. And that's all we're talking about right now. Now, later on, and when I say later on, I'm talking like really almost even December, we're going to talk about uh, uh, in a little more detail some additional effects related to compression because things in compression present a little bit of an, an interesting dilemma among engineers because things in compression like to undergo buckling, okay? And buckling is a whole another animal. For now, um, all we're going to do is just assume that things in tension and things in compression behave the same, uh, which is fine for the purposes of what we're doing right now. Later on, we'll start to look at, uh, at buckling, the idea of, you know, imagine taking a yardstick and pressing on it, how it sort of massively bows out. That's a, that's a concept of buckling. Okay, so let's talk a little bit uh, in more detail about an axially loaded member. So I'm talking about a member that's being stretched or being contracted, you know, tension or compression, okay? So it's, it's really pretty easy to start to write our, our fundamental equations. It's pretty straightforward. Last time we recognized that in the linear range, uh, stresses and strain are proportional, and they are proportional by a constant that we call Young's modulus, or the modulus of elasticity, this capital E. Um, guaranteed you all will uh, uh, conduct lab experiments in either Engineering 215 or CE 321 where you take materials and you load them until failure, and I guarantee you one of the things you're going to have to determine is what is E for this material uh, or that material. <coughs> now usually now, now, hold on. One thing I will say, um, you know, E is only valid when you're talking about that linear range. And remember, when I mean that linear range, go back to the idea of the rubber band. Take a rubber band and load it, 
let it go, what happens? It snaps back to its original position. In, I'd say, 99 cases out of 100, um, we would prefer that materials and all our designs behave that way, okay? Because if they start locking in permanent deformations, uh, their behavior becomes, a, I would say, on average, a little less predictable. So, um, if we assume everything's still in the linear range, then we can say that stress and strain are proportional. Now, what about stress? Let's take each of these one at a time. Well, stress, we've already defined that for axially loaded members. That's just P over A. Taking the load divided by the, the, the cross-sectional area. Now, strain, strain is the change in length over the original length, right? So it's just a plug and chug, all right? So replacing up here stress with P over A, replacing strain with delta over L, rearranging. And what's in that box is a pretty basic, straightforward expression. If I have some bar made out of some material, just for the sake of discussion, let's say this bar is made out of steel, and it's yay long, and it has a cross-sectional area of about, uh, you know, yay wide or what have you, and I apply some force to it, I can tell you how much that bar physically stretches. PL over EA, pretty straightforward. The applied load times the length divided by the Young's modulus times the area, and that's it. It's pretty straightforward, okay? And that is a fundamental equation uh, in this course, okay? I can almost guarantee you when uh, exam one rolls around, this will be on your formula sheet, guaranteed. All right, so far so good? Now, of course, I have to be a little, uh, or make things complicated. Um, this expression is fine as long as two things remain constant, your load and your area, okay? Now, area is pretty straightforward, okay, to, to understand. What if you have a bar that looks something like that? The bar is not... It's not what we call prismatic. When I say prismatic, I'm saying that if I cut a section here versus cutting a section here or cutting a section here, it looks the same. That's not the same with a bar like this. The bar's tapered. The bar's getting bigger or smaller, depending on what direction you're going. So area is a variable. That's very, very, very possible, okay? Another possibility is that the load changes. Now, that one might not be as easy to understand, but I've got an example coming up here in a little bit that will we'll clarify that when, when the load can vary. But if you're dealing with a situation where the, either the load varies or the area varies, you have to look at this from a differential standpoint. You know, if I cut a section, you know, I look at either end of that section, I've got a little bit of an issue because on either end of that section, I've got a different load and a different area. And they vary by a differential amount. So if I'm looking at the displacement of this little, you know, differential element, that's great, but I want the displacement or the deformation for the whole thing that leads to an integration, okay? So I, I don't want to um, scare you away, but we are going to see a little bit of calculus today, so I hope everybody's okay with that. I've, I've done my best to try and keep the calculus pretty basic. We're not going to do anything that's super crazy, so, but all in all, I think what we've got is, uh, is pretty straightforward. Is everybody okay with this? Okay. Now, I think, it, like I said, I think it's pretty clear. It's a pretty uh, easy to understand concept that the area could vary just looking at something like this. I mean, obviously, it's getting, you know, bigger. Um, but the load varying, that might not seem reasonable. I mean, if we're, you know, if, if Austin and I are in a tug of war and he's got a, a rope, a one end of the rope, and I've got another end of the rope, and I'm pulling 20 pounds, it's 20 pounds everywhere uh, uh, along the rope. The load doesn't really vary. However, there are some very clear instances where it could vary, okay? Let's take a look at this example. Now, right off the bat, you're probably looking at some of these numbers and going, what the heck, because I've got a bar that's 5,000 feet long. That's, uh, that's pretty long, okay? But there's a reason for that because I, I really want you to conceptualize what's going on with this, okay? So I want you to imagine in your head some piece of steel. Has anybody ever, I, I've got the feeling at least most of you have interacted or seen rebar before in your life. Am I correct? Okay, all right. All right. Now, th does everybody in this room think they're strong enough to lift up a piece of rebar that's, let's say, one foot long? Something like that? You can do that, right? About two feet long. About 5,000 feet long. Just, yeah, nothing. The, the point is, is that, let, let, let's think about this. The longer that piece of rebar gets, the heavier it gets, right? 
So would it be fair to assume that the load could vary as a function of length? See what I mean? So if I've got a bar, you know, something like this, and it's just hanging down, the longer that bar is, the heavier it is, right? I mean, imagine holding it like this, and imagine the rebar just getting longer and longer and longer. There's a point when you're just not going to be able to hold it anymore, right? Make sense? So this is an instance where the load would vary, okay? This is where the load varies. Our next example, obviously, is when the area varies, all right? Make sense? Everybody good? Okay. All right. So let's take a look at this example, and let's take our time with it, okay? So we've got a bar that's being, you know, fixed on some roof or what have you, or you can imagine just holding it and, you know, holding it down. The bar is really long, and it's 5,000 feet long, but, but again, that's just to make the point. Okay. Now some data has been provided. We've got a modulus of elasticity, a bar length, a yield stress. We've got a bar weight, how heavy that bar is. Um, we've also got a bar diameter. Now one of the things I want to caution you before we begin, start looking at these. I've got a yield stress that's in PSI, pounds per square inch, and a bar length in feet. We've got different units, so make sure you're cognizant of that. That's very possible in the world of metric as well. You can have uh, bar lengths in meters and you can have displacements in millimeters. So make sure that you're cognizant of that as well. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is determine two things. We're going to determine the value of whatever this load needs to be to initiate yielding and then we're going to determine the total deflection. Okay. Now this one is arguably, arguably going to be a little more complicated than that one. Part one is going to probably be pretty easy. All right. Everybody good? Okay. All right. Oh, goodness, it's 76 degrees in here. All right, so example five. All right. So first thing I want to do right off the bat is I want to see if we can write down some of these variables, okay? So let's start off. That modulus of elasticity, that's E, right? So maybe what I'll do is I'll say something like given information. Y'all have probably been introduced um, to a format something like this. You know, here's your givens, here's what you know, and here's what you need to find. You've probably seen something like that before. So we've got that E is 30 times 10 to the 6 PSI. And if you want, you can say 30 million PSI. That's fine. It's however you want to write it. It doesn't really matter. Now, length, okay? Length is 5,000 feet, right? Everybody okay with that? Now, what I'm going to do right off the bat is this. Um, before I even mess around with anything, I'm going to try and deal with a lot of these unit issues right now. So I'm just going to make a choice right off the bat, and I'm going to say let's just convert every length measurement to inches. Okay? There's nothing magic about that. I could convert everything to feet. Okay? The reason why I'm choosing inches is Ultimately, what we're um, about is computing things like deformation, okay? Now, if I sit on this table, it deforms. I obviously wouldn't say it deforms so many miles. I would choose a unit that, that's easy to understand. So maybe it deflects so many inches, okay? So I use inches just because I think it makes sense from the deformation standpoint. If you were in metric, you might want to say millimeters. Although in metric, uh, maybe it's not as big of a deal because everything's, you know, in factors of 10. So it's a little, maybe a little easier to deal with. So 60,000 inches. And is everybody okay with that number? Just take it, multiply it by 12? Okay. All right. So let's see, what else did we get? We were given a yield stress, right? What was it? 59,000 PSI? I'm going to call that... Sigma Y, Sigma yield. You can call it whatever you want. That's a pretty um, 
solid yield stress. Most, like, and I go back to rebar. I apologize to you mechanicals. A lot of my examples are going to be related to civil because I'm a civil engineer. But a lot of rebar that we use is grade 60, and we assume its yield stress is 60,000 PSI. So pretty reasonable value. All right. Now, we also have a weight of the bar. Okay. And we'll say that the weight of the bar is 0 0.167. And it's what? Pounds per foot. Okay? So pounds per foot. Issue there because we've gone ahead and done and converted everything into inches. Okay? So maybe what I ought to do is take this and convert it into pounds to inch. Now, if I wanted to convert this into pounds per inch, what would I do? I divide by 12. Because if something weighs so many pounds per foot, if I'm asking how much, you know, how many pounds per inch, I'm, I'm going smaller. Make sense? You know, something weighs 100 pounds per foot, it only weighs about 8 or so pounds per inch, something like that. And so, you divide that out, you'll probably get 0 0.014, about like that. Close enough for government work. Now, we also have a diameter of the bar, and that came out to be a quarter of an inch. So, in rebar, that'd be number four. All right, sound good? Okay, now let's deal with part A, or the first part of the problem. So what's the first part of the problem asking? The first part of the problem is asking how much does that Q force have to be at the bottom to cause that bar to yield, right? Okay. So. Let's sort, of, let's sort of think about this. Let's imagine that that, well, I'll tell you what, let, let's, go back, let's go back even further, okay? We want to know how much force it takes to cause this bar to yield, okay? Now, what does it mean for that bar to yield? It means that its stress has reached what? Which is? 59,000 PSI. 59,000 PSI is that upper limit. Once we cross that, we've said it yields, okay? Now, to generate 50,000 PSI, or 59,000 PSI, to generate that much stress, how much force am I going to have to apply? Let's think about that. I mean, how do we compute stress? We say it's P over A. So if I'm asking how much force is required to generate so much stress, I take stress times area, right? So I propose to you that therefore, if I want to determine the force that is required to yield the bar, I would say it is the yield stress times the area. Does that make sense? Pretty straightforward, right? Now what's the area? We don't have that, do we? But what do we have? We have the diameter. We know the diameter of that bar is a quarter of an inch. So if we got a round bar that's a quarter of an inch in diameter, how do we find the area? Pi r squared or pi d squared over 4. It's just the area of a circle, right? So we need to determine the area of that bar. So we'll say area. And if you're wanting to keep track of everything, you put area of the bar just to make sure you're keeping track of everything. Pi over 4 d bar squared. And I, I don't use the pi r squared very much. I just use this because if I wanted to use pi r squared, I'd have to take this, divide it by 2, and then do some grunt work. Here, I can just do it all at once. I'm lazy. Let's, let's hit hits to the button on the calculator. So pi over 4, 0 0.25 inches. What does that give you? Oh, whoop. Squared. He's making us do math in the morning. Oh, no. Point one nine six. 
Everybody else getting that? I'm going to make I'm going in, in, in engage in a pattern where he gets an answer somebody else seconding that answer. Motion carries. Okay. Okay. There we go. All right, did you swear it? See, I knew it was I was just I'm making you all get involved, see? When you do concrete design, remembering the areas of, of rebar is something that just sort of gets ingrained into your head. So, All right. Okay. So now there's the area of the bar. Okay. Therefore, the amount of force that would be required to yield the bar would be, if I say PY or P yield, whatever you want to write, it'd be the yield stress times the area. And we'll put area of bar. So... 59,000 PSI times 0 0.049 inches squared. So what's that? Say it again. Two, bless you. 2,891. Do I have a second? 96. Okay, um, are you tracking decimals? Because you might just be entering in the numbers. It, it doesn't, I mean, we're talking about five pounds here, so ultimately I'm not worried about the rounding. So I'll, on mine, I had 2896, but I just, I, what I did is I just took the answer times 59,000. Everybody okay with that? Okay, I had 2896, and I, I had 2896.2. Everybody, everybody else had? Okay, all right. Okay, so let's be clear. If I take this piece of uh, bar and I yank on it and I hit a value of 2896.2 pounds, at that point I've yielded that bar. Make sense? Now, is that the answer? Okay, the problem said determine that value of Q at the bottom to initiate yielding. Is that Q? No, why? Yeah. Well, what other, well, let me ask it like this. What other, is there another load on the bar already? Yes. What is it? It's already experiencing its own self weight. So we got to take that out. You see what I mean? Like, think about it like this. If I got a rope and that rope will fail if I put 50 pounds on it, but it's already got 20 pounds on it, you see what I mean? I've got to put an additional 30 before I fail it. You know what I mean? It's not another 50, it would go past that, right? So we got to figure out how much load is being generated by that self weight. Okay. So how do we do that? What do we know? We know that the bar weighs uh, 0.167 pounds per foot, right? And we know that the bar is 5,000 feet long, right? So it's not, I mean, it goes back to just basic, you know, stuff you learned in statics. If I have a load that's two pounds per foot and it's 50 foot long, it's 100 pounds, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to determine what is the weight of the bar. I'll do it, you know, capital. Weight of the bar is that unit weight times the length. And here, you can plug in whatever number you want as long as you're being consistent. And I was a little fast and loose with this up here because I just sort of put pounds. But I always want to make sure that I'm being consistent with my units. I mean, look up here. Pounds per square inch times square inches. That is pounds. Okay? So I could put pounds per feet times feet, or I could put pounds per inches times inches. It doesn't matter as long as I'm being consistent. So I'll put my original values. 0 0.167 pounds per foot times 5,000 feet. All right? And... What are we getting for that? Eight, 
83.5. Do I got a second? Eight hundred and thirty-five. Is that second? All right, there we go. See, I'm getting y'all active. It's eight o'clock in the morning, and y'all. There we go. Eight hundred and thirty-five pounds. So that bar weighs eight hundred and thirty-five pounds. I mean, I know I'm a, a pretty physically intimidating guy, but I don't think I could lift eight hundred thirty-five pounds. It's a joke, not a very funny one. All right. So it takes about. 2,900 pounds to fail that bar, but I've already got 800 pounds on it due to its own self weight. So how much force do I need to put on the bottom? Therefore, Q is 2,896.2 pounds minus, well here, let me, let, hold on, let me be consistent with the way I'm doing it. So I'm going to say it's the yield force minus that weight. I'm putting those little serifs, those ticks on the W, so you know I'm talking about force, not that lowercase. So. Excuse me. So we got that, and if we plug and chug, what do we get? Excuse me. Two thousand sixty one point two. I got a second? There we go. So there, there's our answer. Well, that's not too bad, is it? Simple stuff, right? Anybody got any questions? Okay. All right. Now before we go on to part B, let's just make clear make sure that we're all clear about something. So any time that you're dealing with an instance where you've got a constant force or a constant area, you don't need any calculus. Okay? Now you could argue the same about like constant or, or changing E values, but it's pretty rare that you're going to have a bar that's steel on one end and, and brass on the other and it's you know mixed up in between. That would be the only instance where E changes and you know that's not going to be variable. You might have a steel bar and a brass bar connected together, but that wouldn't be an instance where you need to use calculus. You just sort of break it up into two problems. But this problem, however, we do have some, some, uh, some variables because while the area is the same, we all agreed that the load varies. I mean, if you have a one-foot piece of rebar, you can probably lift it up. A 5,000-foot piece of rebar, that's a little tough. This bar gets heavier as it gets longer. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. All right. Um, can I go ahead and move on to the next slide, or y'all need y'all good here? Okay. All right. Okay. Part B. All right. So we agree that as the bar gets longer, it gets heavier. So what I'm going to do is any time that you've got a force or a shear or a moment or anything like that that you're unsure of, you always go back to that secret weapon of, of, of engineering, which is a samurai sword or a lightsaber if you happen to be a sci-fi fan, which somebody had an R2-D2 uh, uh, tone on their phone, so somebody's a sci-fi fan in here. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut a section. Now, because I'm not 100% sure where to cut the section and because it ultimately isn't going to matter because I'm going to integrate, I'm going to cut a section at x, at some distance x. So at x. Okay. See, what do I mean by that? Okay, so here's the bar. So there's the bar, and I'm going to cut a section right through here. All right? Now, if I cut a section through that bar right here, what's going to happen? You know, what's going to happen? It's going to fall down. So let's look at that little piece that's going to fall down. Okay? Let's look at that little piece that's going to fall down. So, you know, I'm going to zoom into that a little bit.
Okay. So that little piece is going to fall down. Okay. Now I'm, I'm missing something on my diagram because if you remember, there's also, also that Q force down there, right? From, from the problem, we've got a, a load Q acting on the bottom of that bar. So there's a Q right here. All right. So far, so good. Now, if I, let, let's look at it like this. Okay. So looking at this situation over here on the left, if I cut through that bar, it's going to fall, right? Now, imagine if that Q force was not there. If I cut the bar, is it still going to fall? Yeah. yeah. Why? Because there's another force that that bar is being subjected to. And what is that? It's its own, its own what? Its own weight. Its own weight, right? So what's going on there? Well, we've got some distributed load, right? You know, some you know, force per unit length. We'll call that what? the weight of the bar times some distance. And what is that distance? X, right? We cut that at some distance, some random distance X, right? So far so good? Now, again, we cut the bar, it falls down, okay? It falls down because we've got these forces acting down. But equilibrium tells me that in real life it's not falling down. That inside the bar at that point there must be some internal force. Okay, some internal force here. I'm going to erase. I'm going to use a different color. We'll use black. There must be some internal force inside the bar. Well, just to be consistent with the unit, uh, the notation, we'll say some normal force. Now, I don't know what that is right now. Okay. But there's something going on inside that bar at that point where I made the cut to keep it upright. Okay? It goes back to the same example here. If I'm sitting on this table and somebody cuts it, I fall down. Okay? The reason why is right here, there's some forces inside this table keeping me upright. Okay? Now, how do I find out what that force is? I just use equilibrium. And I recognize that the sum of forces in the y direction must be zero. So I'm going to sum forces in the y direction. Everything going up has got to equal everything going down. And I look at my free body. What do I have going up? I've got this n force, this n of x. All right. Now, what do I have going down? I've got q, and then I've got this, which is the weight of the bar. Remember, that's a force per length, you know, two pounds per foot times however long it is. So I'm going to say I've got Q going down, then I've got the weight of that bar times X. Make sense? And that's the variable. The longer that length is, the heavier the load. Sound good? All right. Okay. So far, so good? Not too bad, right? All right. And here's where the, I can, I can tell some of you are going to say the sacrilege comes into play. To get that you know, total displacement, the total stretch, because the load varies, because, I mean, we have x in our load expression. If it was just q, we wouldn't be worrying about this. But because there's a variable there, we got to integrate from x equals 0 to x equals L. Which, by the way, let's just go back to calculus. Let's say that we're, you know, you know just sort of, just to clear everything up, all right? So I'm going to sort of, you know, engage in a little sort of calculation on the side over here just so we're all clear. Okay, if we were dealing with an instance where, or, you know, I just want to make sure everything's consistent. 
I've been saying that you need to integrate when you've got variable loads or variable areas. But what if they were constant? What if this area was, in fact, a constant value, a constant A? Okay? And what if um, the, this normal force was a constant value as well? Okay? Let, or that's dx. Let's go back to fundamental calculus. All right? Let's see if you all remember. What's the integral of 2? with respect to x. The integral of 2. 2x, right? So if this is constant and this is constant, it's like taking the integral of 2, right? And the integral of 2 would be 2x. So I propose that to integrate this, it would be px over ea from x equals 0 to x equals l, right? Now, how do we handle that? Let's go back to how you do definite integrals. You plug in the top number minus plug in the bottom number, right? So we would get PL over EA minus what? Zero. So we would get this, right? So this formula works if everything's constant. There's just no point. You see what I mean? Everybody okay with that? The only reason that you would do the integration is if either your area varies or your load varies. Okay? Sound good? Okay. All right. Now, I'm going to have to go on to another slide here, but I'm going to do a little bit of plugging and chugging while I can. Okay. So, let's try and keep this simple. All right? When I do integrals, the first thing I like to do is keep it simple. So, if there's any constants I can pull out, let's do that. Can I pull E out? It's constant. What about the area? Can I pull that out? What is the area for this bar? It's just a number, right? We're not dealing with a problem like a... Hold on, let me go back. We're not dealing with a problem like this, where, you know, if I cut a section here versus cut a section here, I get a different area, all right? For this problem, the area, the, you know, the area of that bar is the same here as it is here, as it is here, as it is here. It's all the same, okay? So I propose that for this problem, I can pull the E out and I can pull the A out. Make sense? All right. Because what is A? It's what, 0 0.049, something like that? So it's the same, all right? So I propose that it's 1 over EA times the integral x equals 0, x equals L of that. Move my mouse cursor. Not too bad, right? Pretty straightforward? Okay. All right. Now, I'm lazy, so I'm going to copy this. Everything, everybody got everything up here? Oh, because I'm integrating for the whole bar. Okay, that's, that's a good question. Okay, so what I've done is this. Um, let me go back to the PowerPoint. So what I did is I cut a random, you know, distance x. Okay, and I'm determining, well, what is the force, you know, from zero, you know, if it was zero to x. Okay, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find the total deformation for the whole bar, how much the whole bar stretches. So... You know, if I was talking about, you know, a, a really, really tiny sliver, it wouldn't deflect very much. So, in order to capture the total deformation of the whole thing, I integrate from the whole thing. So, you know, from here to here was x, right? So, this would be from 0 to x. From here to here would be from 0 to l. That makes sense? And in general, you're going to have to integrate across the entire bar. Now, later on, 
Um, we might look at problems where, if, you know, if you've got breaks in how the load varies or how the area varies, maybe you go from 0 to L over 2 and then L over 2 to L and you do two different integrals. And that could happen if we're doing axial loads or torsion or something like that. But that's sort of later. But that's a good question. That's a good question. Did that, did that make sense to everybody else? Okay. All right, good. So let's go back to calculus. Let's see what we can come up with. 1 over EA. All right. Now, we have the integral of a constant times x. So the constant gets pulled out. What's the integral of x? Let's see if y'all remember. 1 half x squared. Remember that? So this is going to be w bar over 2 x squared plus, what's the integral of that going to be? qx. Right? Plug in the top number minus plug in the bottom number. Now what's going to happen when we plug in that bottom number? Zero everywhere, right? So plugging in the top number, all we're going to have, or, or you know, all we're going to have is this. It's going to be 1 over EA times W bar L squared over 2 plus QL. So here, let me move that down a little bit. Make sense? All right. This is a nice, pretty plug and chug equation. I can now determine under that load Q, which we already figured out, how much that total bar is going to stretch. The big thing is making sure you're being consistent with all your units. Okay? Sound good? All right. And if you want, we can, we can simplify this up a little bit by saying this. Um, 0 0.5 W bar L squared plus QL over EA. You know, sort of lump everything together. You can do it however you want. But I'm going to plug and chug down here. So what do we get? Delta equals 0 0.5 times. Now the weight of the bar, what's the weight of the bar? It was 0.167, what, pounds per foot? Something like that? And maybe it, I'm just Got a lot of stuff going on. Maybe I need to make sure I'm diligent. Let's do pounds per inch. So which one was that? 0, 1, 4. Now, when you're doing your homework, it might be, you might think, I don't have to write all that out. I'm making it a point to write out every single unit on every single value so that when we get our value at the end, we see what, where the answer is coming from. All right, the length is what? 60,000 inches, there we go. Squared plus Q ended up being 2061.2 pounds and uh, L is 60,000 inches. And on the bottom, we're going to have what? 30 million PSI and the area .049 inches squared. So first thing I want you all to do, compute some values. Let, let's see if we can agree on the value. I forget something? Zero, one, four, no, 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 no. That, that's a good question, but, but we're talking about pounds per foot. Okay? Go, go, back, go back to the, uh, the example. Look at the bar weight. Okay. See what I mean? Because we're talking about how much it weighs per foot. You, you see what I mean? Now, let me say this. If, if, you know, later on, we might look at problems where we're looking at unit weights. And we're asking how much a material weighs 
per cubic foot. You know what I mean? And then you got to be a little bit careful. So, but, but that's a good point to raise. All right. Anybody got any numbers? 101.27. Okay. Is anybody else getting that number or something reasonably similar? Okay. Let's, let, let's have some other. Okay. All right. A couple things. Make sure you're squaring that. Okay. And make sure you've got the correct number of zeros down here, here, and here. So I'm going to hang out for a little bit, but I'm going to tell you what I have for the value. I got 101. Nine, all, all. Let's see. Now, you getting that? Who else? You got that? Yes, sir. You, oh, you got it. You got it. Everybody good? That, sure. Uh, I, I will concede the point two. Now, what are the units? Inches. Now, this is where being diligent with writing your units comes into play because let's let's sort of do a unit analysis down here on the bottom for what's going on with these units. Let's look at the bottom. Pounds per square inch times inches squared. So PSI times inches squared. On the top, pounds per inch times inches squared plus pounds times inches, right? Okay. Let's sort of simplify that out. What's going on on the bottom? What's PSI times inches squared? Pounds, all right? And then on the top, we've got pounds times inches. What about over here? Pounds per inch times inches squared, that's pounds times inches. So we've got pounds under pounds times inches. So see how we're getting the inches? That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is we're calculating how much it stretches. We better get something like inches, right? This is why I'm, I mean, I, I've seen it before. You know, so I don't feel like writing the pounds and the inches every time. And then they, you know, they don't write down the right value and they get the wrong answer. So I'm doing my best to be pretty diligent with that, okay? Any questions? Not too bad, right? Been too shabby. So far, so good? Okay. I'm going to leave this up here for y'all need writing any of this out? All right. So, just so we're clear, that's the answer. Any questions? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh okay. Well, if you've got pounds time, when I'm doing like a, a unit analysis. So, so the idea is if I, um, if I have two pounds and I add three pounds, whatever I get, it's pounds. You, you see what I mean? All I'm doing down here is just, you know, if I, if I look at this term plus this term, that, that it's the same thing. What I, what I wouldn't want to have happen is pounds per foot plus pounds per inches. Then I'd be adding apples and oranges. Right? That's a good question. Make sure everybody's clear on that. You know? Ask whatever you want. All right. Yes? Well, um, okay, so a, a couple things. If we did not have to consider the weight of the bar at all, like we assume the bar was weightless, it would just be QL over EA, just that force. Because there'd be, the, what, what's making this formula complicated is the self-weight of the bar. If we don't consider that, then this is zero and it's just QL over EA. But in that instance, we don't even need to do the integral, it's just you know, that, the, that constant formula that was provided earlier. Um, the reason that we cut the bar is because of that unit weight. So there's, the way you're asking, there would really be no way to determine that how much that stretches 
if you've got to consider that weight without cutting a section. Does that make sense? Okay. Does that, does that make sense to everybody else? Oh, okay, okay. I, I'm just, uh, let me go back. So, um, P is just referring to the axial force in the bar, and um, in this bar it was just called Q. The, the reason why I called it Q in this problem is because I didn't want this Q force to get mixed up with the self-weight of the bar, or the force that's required to cause yielding. I wanted to call it something unique so that we would all know what we were talking about in this instance. That, that, that's a fair question. It's a very fair question. Anybody else? I mean, please, this is good stuff. All right. Everybody good? Okay. All right. Now, the next problem's a little trickier, and I'm going to pull a little bit of a magic act with this one. Now, with this problem, we're not going to consider the self-weight at all, and I've also left everything a little symbolic. I do my best to try and avoid as much symbolic stuff as I can. Um, sometimes it's advantageous. Um, I'll say this. Um, later on when we do beam deflections, it's actually very advantageous to keep everything symbolic because as engineers, you know, like for instance, as a structural engineer, Every single practicing structural engineer anywhere at some point or another during their career is going to have to design a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load. Guaranteed it's going to happen. Okay? Instead of doing you know, derivations for every single individual simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load, it's advantageous to keep everything symbolic to generate these nice little plug and chug expressions. And then when you're designing, you know, a hundred of these beams a day just plug and chug. Does that make sense? So th there are some instances where keeping everything symbolic is advantageous. Okay? Make sense? All right. Now this bar is, uh, is a little different. We're going to consider that for the purposes of this problem there's no uh, uh, self-weight. I mean yes there is a self-weight on this bar but two things. One, on the last problem, we had a bar that was 5,000 feet long. We're going to assume that's not really the case here, that the self-weight of the bar is present but negligible. That's number one. Okay. Number two, if we had a self-weight on this bar, it would not be pulling along the bar. It would be going like this, right? And in that instance, we would not be dealing with an axially loaded bar. We would be dealing with a beam which we will do beams, but later. Okay? Make sense? So for right now, we're just not going to worry about it. We'll deal with that later. Okay. So in this instance, the axial load is constant. That's not the problem. The problem is that the area varies. So we've got to handle that a little carefully. Okay. Now I'm going to make a, a simplifying assumption in this problem. And then I'm going to ask what happens if I did it a little differently. But that'll, uh, that'll make sense here in a little bit. Okay. All right. Sound good? All right. Okay. Okay. Let's see. All right. Now, like I said, I am going to keep everything symbolic. And every derivation that I do, I'm going to keep it in a symbolic fashion. But I want to illustrate what these number or what these uh, these values would look like if we actually had some 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 hard numbers, some actual data. So I'm going to make up some numbers right at the beginning, but ultimately we're going to try and keep everything symbolic. This is just to sort of illustrate what's going on. So let's just uh, assume some data. And there's nothing magic about this. It's just to uh, illustrate what we deal with later. I mean, like I said, there are advantages to keeping everything symbolic, but we're engineers, not mathematicians. So I think seeing some hard numbers makes our lives a little easier. So we'll just say DA is one half of an inch and DB 
is an inch. We'll say that P is 20 kips. We'll say that E is 10,000 KSI. And we'll say that L is 5 feet or 60 inches. Now, like I said, um, we are not, um, our ultimate goal is just to derive the formula. We're just going to illustrate this here in a little bit. Okay. All right. Sound good? All right. Now, first off, if I cut a section at any point along that bar, what's the axial force inside that bar? Let's go back to it, make sure we're all clear on what's going on. All right. If I cut a four or cut a section right here, what's the force inside that bar? Well, I got P going this way, so I gotta have P going this way. It's the tug of war problem. If I'm in a tug of war with somebody and you cut here, 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 it doesn't matter. It's still the same force inside that rope. The only difference is that the rope itself is getting bigger. That's what's going on here. Sound good? Okay. Okay. All right. So the complicated part is the area. Let's look at the areas. Okay. Now, first off, before we go anywhere, we can easily calculate the area at each end, right? In other words, the area at end A is pi over 4 dA squared, or the area at B is pi over 4 d b squared. Fair point? I mean, that should be pretty straightforward. All right. So if I had the area at A, let's see, let's make sure we're clear on that. What would the area at A be? It would be, here, I'll, I'll do this. I'll do it like this. There we go. There you go. For our data, the area at A would be pi over 4 times a half of an inch squared, and A at B would be pi over 4 times 1 inch squared. All right. So for our data, that'd come out to be what? There we go, and 785. Everybody okay with that? So here, here's my point. There's going to be a lot of symbols floating around. I wanted to come up with some starting numbers so that you all could identify, okay, is this a constant or is it a variable? Because seeing a sub a, you might think, well, that's a variable. No, not really. It's a constant because given some data, you know, data that define the problem, you can easily calculate that. So it doesn't vary along the length. Okay. Sound good? All right. Now, here's what we're going to do for this problem, and then probably sometime tomorrow we'll, we'll make another assumption and look at what happens. So I'm going to say for this problem, will assume the area, and I'm going to highlight that big, the area linearly varies. Okay. All right. And there's a reason why I'm doing that, but let me explain. So what I'm doing is I'm assuming that the actual area of the bar 
Obviously, the area varies, right? It gets bigger as we go down the bar. What I'm assuming, though, is that it's the area that varies, okay? Later on, I might ask the question, well, what if it's not the area that varies? What if it's the diameter that varies? Exactly, it's the diameter, okay? I'm doing that for a reason, okay? You'll, you'll see this later. It, ultimately, it's going to change our integral a little bit, okay? It's not, I mean, for the purposes of what we're doing, I just want you to understand the process, but later on I'll show you what happens if we actually went through and said, well, no, it's not the area that varies, it's the diameter, okay? Because it changes your expression, okay? Now, if the area linearly varies, the key word is it's a line, okay? A line. What do I mean by that? Here's the bar, right? Here we have a A, here we have a B, right? Okay? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up with a coordinate system. And you can either say that the coordinate system starts on the left and goes to the right or starts on the right and goes to the left. It doesn't matter. And you'll see this sometimes in the book drawn something like this. Like it'll say you know, that and it'll say that this is X, that X goes that way. So sort of think of this as if it was a coordinate system and that this is the origin. Okay? So what I'm getting at is that X equals zero right here and x equals L right here. Is everybody okay with that? So from a math perspective, what I'm saying is that at x equals 0, the area is AA, and at x equals L, the area equals AB. Everybody okay with that? Okay. My point is, if you've got two points and you want to find the equation of a line, what's the first thing that you need to do? If you've got point A and point B and you want to find the equation of a line between them, what do you need? Find the slope, right? Now, how do you find the slope? Change in Y over change in X, right? So, what is that? Yeah, so change in Y, we could say AB minus AA over L minus zero, right? Or over that. So far so good? Okay. Now, is this a constant value? Like, can we get a number for this? Yeah, right? Because we've got an area at B, an area at A, and we have a length, right? So technically I could say, you know, I'll put this in blue just to sort of separate this. For our data, M equals what? Uh, I don't need parentheses. over what, 60 inches, right, keeping consistent units, and I'm getting, I mean, it's a small number, I'm getting something about like that. All right. So far, so good. Everybody have this. Should we move on? All right. No way. Let's do that. Okay. So, find the equation of a line. We need the slope and we need the y-intercept, right? Okay. What is the y-intercept? Let's go back to basic graphing. The y-intercept is what is the value of the line at x equals zero. And what is the value of that line at x equals zero? a sub a, right? At x equals zero, it's a sub a. 
So I'll say, you know, going back to what we had before, M is AB minus AA over L. B is the y-intercept, which is AA. And obviously that's a constant. All right. So far so good? So this is what I propose to you. Okay, this is what I propose to you. Therefore, if we want to determine how much this bar stretches, like before, it's the integral from x equals 0 to x equals L of the axial force divided by EA dx. So far so good? Now, What is the axial force in this bar? Go back to the tug-of-war problem. P, it does not change, right? It is constant. So I propose to you that it's the integral from x equals 0 to x equals L. That top is just P. We have E. Now what about the area? The area, we said, varies linearly. It's a line. mx plus b. So going back to what we said earlier, I'm assuming that the area linearly varies. Okay? But, but as he pointed out, it's not really the area that varies, it's the diameter. What would happen? You'd get a different expression down here. Okay? Now you can do that, but I'm just trying to make a point about how this stuff works. I'm trying to do my best to avoid Calc 2 all over again. But I, I can see, though, that you all are really want me to talk about Calc 2 since you're so excited about it. I've got jokes. I'm going to try and keep you all laughing. Learning and laughing. All right. So let's go through this a little bit. Factor out the constants. So P over E, integral from X equals 0 to X equals L of DX over mx plus b, right? Now, um, just to bring it back a little bit to the world of Calc 2 uh, or Calc 1, I'm still not 100% sure where you cover this topic, you can probably find some textbook or something somewhere that has that uh, integral listed in it, or I, I know things, there's things like Wolfram Alpha, you know, you go to Google and you just type it in, I know things, um, or to be, to be you know, classical and go back to the way that you probably first learned how to do this, do a little bit of substitution. Let u equal mx plus b, right? So du is what? mdx, right? Remember that? So dx is d u over m. That looks like a w. Y'all remember that stuff? So therefore, I can say this equals p over e. And um, I'm actually going to leave the limits the way they are. I mean, technically, I could start plugging in new expressions for the limits, but I'm going to say x equals 0 to x equals L. Like I could plug in that and say from u equals b to u equals ml plus b, but I ain't worry about that. So we've got d u over m divided by u. See what I did there? The dx became du over m. This stuff on the bottom became u, right? This is a fraction, this is being divided, so I can pull this out. I'll sort of move this down here. So P over E M and we have that, right? Now, now we're testing your memory banks. Anybody remember what the integral of that is? Natural log, right? Natural log of u. So 
it's the it's P over EM times the natural log of U. Oh. from x equals 0 to x equals L. So I ought to probably just go ahead and substitute that back in and say P over EM natural log of MX plus B x equals 0 to x equals L. Okay. I'm sure some of the math purists in the room are like, wait, isn't there an absolute value in there somewhere? Yeah, but Keep in mind what we're talking about. We're talking about mx plus b. What is mx plus b? It's the function that represents the area. Are we going to have a negative area of the bar? You see what I mean? I mean, no, it, this is important. It's important to recognize, you know, that that, that, that really doesn't exist. So um, you can put the absolute values in there if you'd like, but it's not really going to change anything. Make sense? All right. Okay, so starting to feel a lot like Calc 2 all over again, isn't it? I'm doing my best to try and avoid that. But the diameter one, that one gets a little different. Okay. What time is it? Okay, I can finish this up real quick. All right. So what do we have? We have P over EM. We have the natural log of ML plus B minus the natural log of B, right? And again, that's not going to be negative either because that's just the area at A. Now, right, any way I can simplify that, if you have the natural log of 3 minus the natural log of 2, what does that equal? There you go. Yeah, if you got the uh, two uh, natural logs that are subtracted, you can take the top divided by the bottom, right? So you can say, therefore, P over EM times the natural log of ML plus B divided by B. And really, that's the answer, okay? Because M is just AB minus AA over L, and B is just your, your area at A, and that's it, okay? Now, how does that, again, how does that change if we go back and say, well, it's really not the area that varies, it's the diameter. All that changes is this function up here, which changes the way we do our integrals. It just changes the calculus. I can show you all that next time. It's not anything special. It's just I'm not in the habit of turning this into a calculus class. You know what I mean? So um, there's going to be calculus in here, I promise, but we're going to do our best to keep it as basic as possible and keep it, you know, I don't want it to prevent learning mechanics of deformable bodies, you know? All right. Anybody have any questions? Okay. Next time what we're going to do is we're going to investigate a different type of axially loaded problem. And that's dealing with a problem that is indeterminate, which we, if you've got me for structural analysis, we've mentioned indeterminate. We're actually going to do indeterminate problems starting next week in here. So that's all I have for you all today. I will see you all next week. You all have a good weekend, a good Labor Day weekend. But don't forget, you got a homework due Tuesday at 8 a.m. Hold on.